Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. You know, I have, uh, we all like to talk, but at home not too many people like to hear what I have to say. And I'm delighted to see that you come all to hear what, uh, <clears throat> my, my outlook about leadership. When um, Juliana and Brian came to talk to me, the first thing I told them, I said, leadership is really something that is not very familiar with with what I do, what I learned, though I know there are hundreds of books about leadership, about workshops, about leadership, how you become a leader. And I think you become a leader because the opportunity to be one presents to yourself. So I have the slides because uh, just in case you don't understand me, you can always read it. And then second, I know I don't get sort of sidetracked about all these millions of ideas that are coming to my brain at one time. Um, leadership, you, know, you have to go and go to the dictionary, especially because English is not my first language, to understand exactly how the rest of the people understand leadership. It is, it is a, an individual that influences other people to follow them. And of course, in, in this leadership role, we all have our ethics and our um, values and our beliefs that will kind of mold what a leader is all about. But the most important thing about leadership is that bosses are not leaders, though they believe they are. It would be wonderful to have <laughs> our, <laughs> all our bosses being leader. Unfortunately, they are not in that point, selected in that position because of their leadership, but simply because they're in the right place at the right time. And, um, my kind of leadership is based on creativity. And maybe that's because that's the realm of my work, both as an artist, as an architect. For me, creative ideas are really today the most important thing in the society in which we're living. And creativity in the dictionary is as amazing that still today creativity is a part of creating a work of art. But in reality, creativity is not a work of art. Creativity today, which has become very much a buzzword, uh, is applied to so, so very many different uh, activities and many things we do. There are other words that are involved in creativity, originality. Well, you can be original without being creative when you make something a little bit different from what somebody else did. Uh, imaginative, you can be inventive, you can be ingenious, but there are different, you know, different levels of creativity, which in reality <clears throat> is what the basic of our thought process is. Uh, creativity involves all your brain, the right part of the brain, the left part of the brain, and uh, with logic and planning. Can creativity be t taught? Definitely so. I'm convinced that we all can be creative one way or the other, trying to uh, think differently. But we have to encourage this. We have to encourage this for a long time and uh, from since we were small. And I was referring before about creativity in, uh, in different companies that they, now they are businesses who really encourage creativity. And actually yesterday, there was an article, and if you read the Wall Street Journal, you will read that better ideas are, are rewarded, and failure is rewarded. And there today, and in the article, it was a very nice example about how now uh, new companies or companies are <clears throat> promoting creativity. And the example is kind of funny because it is in an in a <clears throat> advertising agency who was trying to get a contract with a company that makes cat litter. Cat litter is really not that very difficult. It's difficult to promote and think that everybody has to have cat litter. So one, one of the ladies that was in the company decided to bring the cat litter from her, from her host house and put it underneath the table where they were going to meet with the possible future um, uh, clients. Well, imagine, uh, 
this was rather unusual and everybody was very surprised and some people from, from the client's portion got up and left because they were uh, abhor about the fact that there was cat litter under the, the, the conference table. But the owner of the firm, despite the fact that they don't know if they got the contract or not, really gave her an award because she had the courage with a new idea with a great possibility of failure. So creative thinking is also taking the, advantage, taking the responsibility that not all the time that we think creatively we're going to hit the spot exactly how it goes. Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of research in creativity. We're very creative when we're small. For each idea, we have 60 solutions. Then we become educated and we come where our world becomes smaller and smaller and it's only one road because that's more or less the road we know. And so our creative ideas are always encased in that narrow road of our educational system, our education, either our degrees or the work we do. So we have to try, you know, we have to be brave and try to uh, get out of that road. Now, creativity and geniality, and being a genius, I guess we all try to be one. It's, you know, I think it's possible. But I think it's possible in the same relation as it is the effort that you want to do, that you want to put into your creative ideas, or your creative thoughts, or your creative possibilities. I guess if we all practice 16, 17 hours a day piano, we might have possibility of becoming a Mozart. And if we practice tennis for 10 hours a day, we may be Vanessa Williams. But how many of us, how many of us are really ready to make that commitment to one part of our life, forgetting about pretty much or leaving behind all the other ones? So we have not too many geniuses, but we have many creative people. The work, the idea of a creative class has been around and, and an artist started this, uh, coined this idea in 1994. But it was Richard Florida, and I don't know if you're familiar with him, he wrote a book about the creative class sometimes in the 90s, and he's been here in Grand Rapids several times to talk about our city officials, about um, how to improve, how to make our city more lively, because he considers that the creative class, those people who think creatively and live together in a high density area will give the city a new life. And as I mentioned to you, I've been very much involved in the downtown because um, I would like to have a city that looks pretty much or closer by to where I come from, which is a small town, one and a half million people, but the activity in the street, the life in the street, makes the city like it is today for art price, but 12 months out of the year. So for this, I guess we need a creative class. Now, the creative class is divided, I guess, in several, three, three possibilities. The creative people who do not have a specific education and come up with a fantastic idea and make it happen. And I will talk about some examples of that. The other creative people is those that have an education and be creative based on all of the educational stages in which they have gone through. And there is a third class, the Bohemians, that are very creative, but they don't come, they don't come out of any of the other two. And sometimes they're brilliant, and sometimes they're incomprehensible. Well, I, I wanted to talk about education and how we can be, all become leaders and how we can learn about being, being leaders. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in today, and there are many educators here, so um, <clears throat> they will understand what we're talking about and how we can understand education. I think one of the biggest problems about education is we put all the children, all the young people into two categories. Either you're intelligent or you're not intelligent. And how do we measure this? We measure this with a whole series of tests that we can learn because there are classes that you learn how to take tests. So people who take these classes are very good at the test. But it really leaves behind 
a tremendous amount of people, a tremendous amount of young people and old people too, that have great deal of abilities that are not encased, are not translatable into one specific test that will give you the degree that you are capable of doing. Uh, <clears throat> we reward excellence and we punish failure, which is not a good idea at all because as I mentioned to you before, this new company that the lady may not get or may have lost the litter, the cat litter contract was creative enough to think of something without the fear of failure. So it's very, very important to let the young people be comfortable with that concept. Linear thinking is not very good for creativity. And, and I, always, I always refer back to the fact that we as artists do not think linearly. We think all together. It's a mixture of all these things uh, that eventually give us a result, uh, a work of art, which then we have to write a statement about. And that's the killer of what we do. Because then we try to figure out what can we write about it. And we make a story so people understand it, when in reality what we're trying to do is create a feeling, an experience expression, uh, reaction, positive or negative, but do something to the viewer. That doesn't necessarily have to mean what we are thinking about. We can talk about inspiration, we can talk about, yeah, but linear thinking doesn't work for us at all. This is the article I was referring to in, uh, no, we passed one. There's something, okay. I have to talk about the multiple intelligence because I had the opportunity to meet Howard Gardner. Dr. Gardner was in Grand Rapids giving a lectures and I was absolutely fascinating, fascinated by his concept of the multiple intelligence. He's, he definitely feels very strongly about the fact that uh, in a teaching system, we leave behind uh, youngsters who have great deal of talent and many other things. And they may not be able to learn mathematics the way that traditionally we have to learn mathematics, they have to learn it another way. There are people who have great ability, innate ability for uh, the logic and mathematics and they can understand what is behind the numbers. There are other people who have this perception of space and maybe architects and artists have that. We can see the space even when it's on a piece of paper. We have linguistics, and it doesn't mean only speaking different languages. It means the use of your own language in a very, very uh, wonderful and expressive way. Uh, those are people who write, I guess. The, one, the, the kinetic people, the people who uh, play games or play football or basketball that are able to perceive the game before it even happens. They may be terrible, and sometimes you hear these people speak on the television, and they're completely inarticulate. But when they leave that position and go into their own realm, they're fantastic. They can do things that you could never imagine doing. Interpersonal and extrapersonal uh, is very important, because I think we all have to know what we're good at. And we have to accept that we cannot be good in everything. And we should work on the, those things that we're very good at and kind of try not to hide but not to promote the ones that we, are, we have not the talent to do it. And the extra personal is the people who understand other people, which, you know, there are some fantastic people. Some of our politicians, I guess, will enter into this despite the fact that the end result of understanding us is not very good at the end, but, uh, Nonetheless, um, they try to remember your name, they try to remember what you do, they try to remember how you stand in society. And so I think people who are in sales and marketing would be very, very good, in, will have that kind of intelligence. And then the naturalistic, intelligent, those people who feel very comfortable in the outside environment, who can understand what happens in the natural world and, and, and translate this into new knowledge. I mean, feel comfortable sitting in the middle of nowhere and finding beauty and knowledge and 
into all of this. The people who study, um, ch uh, they're farmers. People who farm are very much in tune with, with what the land gives them. And the existential, I think Howard Gardner mentioned existential because he did not want to refer as um, talking about religion because religion for many is a term that curtails your imagination and puts you too much in a preconceived pattern. So existential would be at those people who have the possibility to understand very concepts that are not translatable into formulas or into very specific you know, writings. The philosophers are very much into this existential kind of a way. So we go back to this article that I referred already several times until I found the, the, the uh, video, uh, the slide. Uh, in, in the New York Magazine, and, and it's a fascinating article about education. I mean, it's, it touches very, very many subjects, but basically, in two words, it says that we are really doing a terrible job because we're dividing the world intelligent and non-intelligent. Though they do not talk about the multiple intelligence of Howard Gardner, they talk about a new word that is character on the individual and worked on the character of the individual as a very important part in the development of the education of the, of the younger generation. For, for those who have not read the article, it's really very, very worth reading every detail. There are several schools now that are, uh, most of them private schools around the country who are experimenting with this new system of education that will require, of course, a dramatic change in our educational system, probably getting rid of the grades, probably teaching the children together of different ages, in, in different rooms, in, di in different ways, and using technology because, you know, when we went to school, there was, there was nothing, really. I mean, there was a radio, but they had, they had no television, no computers, no uh, calculators. My goodness, when I went to architectural school, I was so happy. That makes me very old if I tell you that uh, I, I was very proud that I was a master of the slide rule. When I showed the slide rule to my grandson, he couldn't figure out how come we could do all of these things with just two pieces of metal of, of, uh, metal or whatever, or wood, just sliding it back and forth. We could do logarithms and we could do uh, square roots. And for this, he needed three times the books, number of books and calculators to do the same thing. So in some ways, yes, we're going forward in some ways, I think, the fact is that we did not have all of these things made us very creative in, in what we did. <clears throat> entrepreneurs, and I'm going to give you some examples of what you think entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs undoubtedly are very creative people. They, they promote ideas or they make uh, a reality, an idea that just crosses their mind. And, and it doesn't have to be very highly educated people or very complicated ideas. It just needs the fact that it is an idea that you, that many people have, and you made it a little bit different. And one, I'm going to talk about several examples that are very familiar to all of us. And one of them is coffee, Mr. Schultz, in the famous Starbucks coffee company. Uh, I just read the other day that we take 450 million cups of coffee are served every year, every day in USA. So that was a good business. When <laughs> uh, Mr. Schultz, who eventually became associated with, with Starbucks, uh, started his, or worked with a company, when at the time, uh, this was at, you know, in 1980s or, yeah, the 1970s, when coffee was served here, and let me tell you, I hope I don't offend them, offend you as US citizens, but the coffee in America was terrible. <laughs> I mean, when Europeans or Latin Americans came here and had a cup of coffee, everybody said, it's like umbrella juice. I don't know if you remember that in the old times, there was these black umbrellas that were not color fast, and so when it rained, 
they gave this brownish color that was a little brown. And, and I never tasted it, but the American coffee was pretty much like that. And I think for the rest of the people, the, you know, 200 million Americans, 300 million Americans, it was okay. For the two or three million people that traveled to the United States every year, it was not. <coughs> Mr. Schultz went to, and I'm cutting the short, the, the story short because it's very long and I only have half an hour to speak. Um, he went to Euro, uh, Europe, and of course in Italy, you know, coffee is, is something very important. Not only it becomes a, a very good drink, but it also is a place to meet people, and everybody in the morning, the first thing they do, they get up and they go to the coffee in the corner or whatever it is, and meet their friends, and are served in a jiffy, in a minute, they prepare the coffee by a barrister who's very nicely dressed, with a white shirt, black pants, and uh, bow ties. So he thought this was a new idea with, it, with something that everybody took every day to promote the coffee in America. And he tried it. And at the beginning, this idea of the barristers being dressed so nice didn't work very well. The idea of putting opera didn't work very well. So eventually, it came down to buying fantastic coffee machines in Italy and creating a need to drink a different type of coffee. I don't have to tell you how successful um, Starbucks is today. And it was really a very simple idea. Only that 250 million cups of coffee are served every year and somebody thought we can really bank on it and charge you three times or four times as much and everybody pays it very happily. Uh, <clears throat> Netflix, no, that's a new phenomenon of this, of this century. Blockbuster was been around for a long time, renting us CDs, and everybody thought it was wonderful. We went to the Blockbuster that was at the corner of our, you know, where we lived and selected it. Until one day, Mr. <coughs> Hastings thought that he was overcharged with late fees. He got very upset about it. And he says, this cannot be possible, and we're going to make something different. And created this company with a flat fee that you rent, uh, you rent the CDs, you know, just because he was charged a little bit of money, he was creative enough to find a solution to the problem. Today, Netflix has uh, 200 million or 300 million subscribers. And though lately, I'm sure you read in the news, that they are undergoing some problems because they became greedy, they wanted to charge too much, and the public objected to it. So they have now two companies, because on the other hand, they are very creative too, and they know that the CD is going to disappear. In a few years, you know, we'll have a collection of CDs next to collection of VCRs and next to collection of, of all the other elements that we have using for entertaining because we're going to be able to watch the movies in direct stream. So they're preparing, they're moving, they're, so they don't want it to happen at Blockbuster that was an incredible company that was successful for more or less 20 years, I think. Okay, what about the water? I mean, this has really been an incredible change in how people drink water. Before, we drank water when we got up in the morning, or we went to work, or we went to a restaurant. Now, we cannot leave our house without a bottle of water. I mean, it's like going to the desert. Everybody carries water. I mean, we go to church, they carry water. We go to the concert, and people have a bottle of water. I don't know what happened to us before. There must have been thousands of people in the street dying of thirst. But don't you think that is a very creative way of saying, yes, you drank water all the time, but now you really need it 24 hours a day and you have to carry it with us. Perrier started this many years ago and when they started to export it to US, somebody picked it up and made it an incredible business out of it. The last example of just fantastic entrepreneurship is Whole Food Market, and we were just talking with somebody about that. Whole Food Market was started by a company, it went through different changes, but they decided to, to market, uh, you know, mar the, the market, the, the fruit or the, 
the um, vegetables that came from the surrounding area. Then, of course, it came the craze of organic. But what was very interesting in Whole Food is how the merchandise. You went to the to Whole Food supermarket and you saw the display of, of apples or oranges, and it looked so fantastic that instead of buying one, you bought ten because it was a, a joy to the eye. They merchandise. Uh, food as, we, as they merchandise clothing and other elements. So they have become, of course, very, very, very famous. And especially, I think, what made the change in their company was when in the year 2000, they opened a whole food market at the Warner Building in New York. In the middle of Manhattan, in the basement of this incredible new construction, which is sort of a vertical shopping center, there is food market this whole food. And uh, so that, you know, brought that, I think, brought the idea to the general public. And today, uh, all, I think, all supermarkets, in one way or the other, have copied the merchandising technique of whole food. So again, you see, this is an idea of an entrepreneur that saw more than what everybody thought a market on it. But I have to talk, of course, about creativity in my field, architecture, because that's the second part. This is the creativity based on education. And of course, there are hundreds of examples of very creative architects, especially now the young generation, who is much more bold and much more eager or much more ready to experiment that my generation and the generation of the two people, which are the generation of the two examples that I'm going to give. One of them is Frank Gehry, who was kind of the enfant terrible of the architecture when in 1971. He designed a house in California in the middle of this wonderful neighborhood. He put a house made of corrugated metal and chain link. And I mean, it was really, the, the, the neighbors almost passed out because it was going to, it was going to lower the, the, the value of the neighborhood, the neighborhood because it was like a shack built in the middle of, of this super duper neighborhood. But what he wanted to say is that architecture goes beyond and has to go beyond just designing always the same thing doing with the same materials. So houses were synonymous of brick or wood siding or stone. He wanted to show that you can build a house and for him be successful by using materials that were not traditionally so. Of course, he went on to, um, to create different forms of architecture and he was creative enough to find the computer that will help them build this. And he found that in the uh, aeronautic, uh, aeronautic manufacturing because there's a program called CATIA that designs in three dimension and then you can send it directly to the factory and they will manufacture the piece like and then you can put all of these buildings together that you see uh, that uh, Gary designed. That has also changed the way we looked at architecture and expect to see in architecture forms that were not familiar with us before, and, and the platform for all this young generation of people who based in this, and he uses material, the, the <clears throat> Guggenheim Museum in, Bil in Bilbao used titanium, which is not a material that has been used before in, in construction. And uh, so this, this houses he designed. Most of his buildings at the beginning were designed in outside Europe, outside US. US has been a little reluctant to uh, embrace these ideas. <laughs> I mean, you imagine if somebody will come up with this kind of design for downtown Grand Rapids. I mean, I don't think even in New York it will work. And what about this one? Most of these are, it, one is in the Czech Republic, if I remember correctly. The other one is in, in uh, Austria. And of course, now architects are expanding 
their horizons and designing other things that are not traditionally, uh, we didn't learn how to design these things in school, which is uh, ceramics, and most of them now design jewelry. The second uh, architect that I would like to talk about is Saha Hadid. Saha Hadid is an architect born in Baghdad. She uh, was a mathematician and afterwards studied in London and became an architect and is presently offices in London. Sada Hadid worked for many, many years in, um, with, with projects that were not possible to be built. They were so far out, so way out in their thought process that it was difficult to find uh, a client first and also the possibility of finding the people who could build this for her. But um, she was persistent and she believed in herself. I mean, she's a, a very interesting woman. She's very big, much taller than I am. And you know, her personality is kind of overwhelming and goes very well with what she designs. Um, she won a competition in Singapore in the year 2000 that launched her in the international market. And today, her work is seen around the country and even, even in the United States. This is a, a ski jump that is very, very beautiful. You see it when you drive to, to, towards Austria. Uh, and, but she did design a building in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is that uh, contemporary art center that in within her designs, this is, was toned down tremendously, but it is, uh, it's, I, I visited it, it's an interesting building. This Hotel Puerta America, and, and the, the drawing, the, the photographs are difficult to see. Puerta America, that's another interesting concept of how creatively you can be different from the others. There are hundreds of hotels in Spain, and this, this company wanted to build a new one, and trying to make a difference and say why people would stay here and not in a Hilton or in, or in a Marriott they decided to invite the top architects of the world to design a floor or a room. So you went to the hotel and you decided to stay in foster uh, room or you decided to stay in a uh, Sada Hadid room. And there were a long list of about 20 architects who designed these different floors. We stayed in Sada Hadid room because I was fascinated by her concept of, of uh, designing. The room, as you see, is all white. There were no straight lines. Everything was sort of flowing because it was done in a material similar to Corian, a, a plastic material that is formed. But you realize once you go through this experience of staying in a room like this, that it was really unsettling because every time you put something, it fell down, <laughs> fell on the floor. <laughs> the bathroom, and you see on, on one side here, the bathroom, that thing down there is the waste basket. And, and um, the, the shower had, had this form that you stood in the shower and you felt that you were in a spaceship because it had no, no edges. Everything is surrounded. And the color, of course, the white color was you know, more, more disruptive, I think. But we enjoyed it. It, 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 was, <laughs> it was a great experience. And, and so I, I decided next time we should go and stay in another room, because every time you go to, a, to the hotel, you, you have a different experience. Sada Hadid, of course, has left also the realm of traditional architecture, and now is designing shoes, as you can see there, some for Lacoste, and the shoes have, have a different look. They look different from what uh, Jimmy Choo or whatever, <laughs> all of these super designers of shoes are doing. They have this twist of somebody who's not trained as a shoe designer. Um, she designs cars too. And uh, <clears throat> maybe someday some of our you know, uh, big uh, car manufacturers will be daring enough and try something like this. This, this is part of an exhibit presently at the Philadelphia Museum about uh, Sada Hadid and the possibilities of design. <clears throat> we talked uh, design, I mean, 
being creative means that you have to change the world in which you live. And as we very well known, and I mentioned I refer something like this of how somebody asked me how what we could do to improve the city and what we would do on a regular basis to make it more livable, more attractive. And I, meant, I answered the change is difficult. It's difficult for big companies is because they're being, you know, they're so used of doing ABC and that's the way it's going to be. And, and the example is that they just fixed Granville Avenue. They spend a ton of money and they continue to put the parking meters. Parking meters <coughs> are a sign of what? 50, I don't know how many years ago. It looks ghastly. And somebody was mentioning, I mean, uh, Ralph Auenstein was telling me that the parking meters came from this idea of the time of the horses, that they put this, <coughs> these pilasters there to, to, you know, to hold the horses. And now we change the horses with the parking meters. For them. They look ghastly the same, and maybe someday the city will come to the idea that they do have to change and look into the, really the future to make things looking much better despite the, but not, not easy, not easy. So we'll keep on trying <laughs> to make uh, the big companies change. And uh, because life is a change. Life is a change because unfortunately we grow old um, we change, we cannot move as fast as we did, we cannot, you know, do maybe the things, all the things, so we have to adjust. So change is inevitable. What it is, what we can change is how we grow with it, how we, are, how we use our cha the changes that we cannot, you know, you cannot leave behind, and we make it very positive. So growth is optional, and I hope everybody things very positively, including the city that has to grow <laughs> into uh, becoming a, a much more modern and contemporary environment. So, since future, the future is not predictable, I think we have to work hard to invent it. So that's what Alan Kay said. And thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share. I have many more thoughts, but I could not put them all together here about how to all of us could be creative, how can we be genius, and how do we have to change every day to adjust to all the possibilities that our city or our environment has to offer. Thank you. <laughs>